Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this um, uh, webinar this afternoon uh, of uh, In Vivo Quest. It's the uh, actually the, the last uh, session of the In Vivo Quest tour for 2020-2021. Um, we are currently in the last uh, session, the last one of the seven sessions that were organized this year uh, since September uh, 2020. Um, my name is Marie Cecile Demave. I'm the head of innovation and international affairs in the French think tank Agride, and uh, I'm an agronomist. And I'm going to be the moderator for uh, today's webinar. Um, so, uh, In Vivo Quest, as you may know already, is an open innovation platform. It's actually an international program uh, that aims to detect innovative project holders. Um, across Europe, uh, innovative and promising startups in ag tech and food tech across Europe uh, to, um, to, to, that actually find um, interesting ways to solve uh, the, the current issues that we're all facing uh, that are uh, climate change and transitions in agriculture. Um, so uh, today's conference is going to focus on a very promising concept that is called the bioeconomy, the bio-based economy. Um, we are going to focus on its potentials and, and limitations, and also how to ensure an efficient scale-up of bio-based products. So we are going to have um, three great speakers today to, uh, to address this, uh, this issue. We have um, the professor, uh, Dr. Stephanie Broering from the University of Bonn, the Institute of Food and Resource Economics. Um, uh, professor Broering, you are professor for technology, innovation, uh, management and entrepreneurship in the uh, University of Bonn. Uh, we, uh, the, the second speaker is going to be uh, Florent Allais. Dr. Allais, you are the Director and Professor of Green Chemistry at Research and Development in the uh, Unit ABI uh, in AgroPeritech, uh, the French University uh, AgroPeritech. Um, and, but you're also the Adjunct Professor in Monash University in Australia, and also the Courtesy Associate Professor in the University of Florida. Um, and our third speaker today is uh, Jenny Kay. And Jenny, you are the research and development and quality manager in, in the uh, startup Circular Carbon. Um, so welcome to the three of you. And um, Dr. Broering, we're going to start uh, with you. I would like first to ask the three of you uh, to self-introduce yourselves um, in two minutes so that uh, all our participants will be uh, uh, able to identify each of you very more clearly. Okay, should I say two words about myself? Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to interact with very interesting other speakers and also the audience. I'm looking forward to that. Well, as you said, I'm Professor Nbom. And um, yeah, since 2013, I'm working here to foster the bioeconomy and the transition towards a more sustainable future from a technology innovation management perspective. And also now lately, our chair has a, a new component in the name, which is entrepreneurship. Uh, so that's our main vision. And I will tell you later on more what this means and how perhaps the overall transition can benefit from some research and how we as researchers perhaps can also benefit from getting more insights from also your insights and discussions here today. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Breuring, I think you had a second slide with a, well, uh, uh, an introduction to, uh, to the whole team you, you're working with. Okay, yes, sure. Uh, perhaps what makes us quite um, yeah, uh, special in, in the you know, landscape of different chair groups is that we are working um, not only from a management perspective, but also with some deeper insights in, into the technologies itself. So there is also people who did study biotechnology or sustainability management um, in my group. So we do have a very various backgrounds here to really understand the phenomena, let's say the different bioprocesses also, and then the overall um, impact these may have on the transition towards a bio-based economy. So that's us here. That's me, that's actually a field of SILFI, a renewable resource 
um, which is also very interesting. So that's the, the agricultural faculty at the University of Bonn, where, you, uh, where we did do an excursion last year, when it still was possible. You see some distance here, but perhaps <laughs> not possible today to take a picture like this. Thank you, Dr. Broering. Uh, so transdisciplinary, uh, the bioeconomy is transdisciplinary. It's, it's one of the first messages of, of today's uh, webinar. Um, Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Allais, uh, Florent Allais, um, uh, could you please um, give us a few words about yourself and uh, the, this AgroParis Tech uh, unit that uh, you work in? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, first, thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here today. And I hope I'll be able to provide you with some information of what, what we are working on in the lab. So uh, I'm, uh, I am an organic chemist per training and I'm the director of the, what we call URD ABI that stands for uh, Research and Development Unit dedicated to uh, industrial agrobiotechnologies. So basically, this is a, a team that belongs to AgroParisTech, which is a grande école in France. It's like the university somehow. And our team is um, dedicated to the valorization of biomass and byproduct. So basically, by combining green chemistry, biotechnologies, downstream process, and analytical chemistry, we aim at devising value chains that are able to transform byproduct into end products with high, medium to high value added. Value added. So basically we start from local, but also uh, biomass that we can find from all over the world. And we try to convert them into end products such as cosmetics, food, feed, plastics, and so on. And the idea is to provide values to something that is more or less not va very valorized to date. So through some examples that give you some, uh, some ideas what we are doing in the lab to, to improve the, uh, the, uh, the value of some biomass locally grown. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allais. Um, we also we have already seen with you that uh, the bioeconomy can be based on a diversity of types of, of biomass yeah. and also uh, generates a, a diversity of, of products in, mm -hmm. in various sectors, food and non-food, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Kay, uh, could you please introduce yourself and uh, give us a few words about circular carbon, please? Um, hello everybody, um, my name is Jenny Kay. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in France from British parents. Um, I studied biology uh, in Imperial College in London and then specialised in applied microbiology and biological engineering in Paris. Uh, I have worked 10 years in the food industry uh, in a company uh, called Mondelez. Uh, I've worked in microbiology and food safety um, supporting product developers um, develop safe food and understanding the product shelf life um, and also uh, work in product development of cocoa beverages and sauces and also uh, carried out a number of uh, roles supporting quality um, in other product categories and food categories uh, helping manufacturing sites um, implement quality procedures and um, solve quality related issues so I have a good understanding of um, the food manufacturing supply chain and quality standards uh, in different foods uh, from chocolate to canned food. Um, I decided to change my career and work in a field which was um, contributing to sustainable and environmental solutions. And so for a year now, I've been working for Circular Carbon uh, in product development and quality. And my role there is to under, understand the potential application of biochar, uh, run tests in different application fields and support our team uh, on, on different technical and quality topics. Thank you very, very much, Jenny. Um, so circularity is the, <laughs> the other keyword that you are introducing in the conversation here. Um, so while um, Dr. Broering is now um, starting to share her presentation, uh, let me tell you in the public that uh, you may use the Q&A button uh, to ask your questions uh, in the, it's the button in, in the, um, uh, in the bottom of, of the screen, and you may ask uh, your questions uh, as they come to you, to you, and then we will um, uh, ask them to uh, our, our speakers as they come or as they
session. Dr. Boring, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I hope everybody is now looking at the first slide. You can see that, yeah? Yes. Okay, that's, all, that's brilliant. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, okay, the, you see the briefing I got from Invivo Quest was to pretty much start uh, at the very beginning of what is actually the bioeconomy um, and uh, what are perhaps barriers for, for the bioeconomy to unfold and uh, how can we overcome those with bioentrepreneurship and some more resilience in, in existing business models. So this slide you already know. So what do, did I prepare here for today? I would like to give you a brief overview of where we are what different types of innovation we have at the second point, and then also to look together with you and perhaps also inspire some discussion around the question, how can we actually move the bioeconomy from our minds to the market? Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. If you dig, and I did do that last evening through the old uh, documents, uh, you see that already in 2005, uh, the former EU commissioner, Janice Potocnic, put Dutch Nick, sorry, um, had the or coined the term knowledge-based bioeconomy. So you, you see that abbreviation all over the place. It's KBBE, knowledge-based bioeconomy, which means, according to this concept, that first of all, the bioeconomy encompasses different activities, different industrial and economic activities that make, that make use of renewable biological resources for the provision of products and services. And now that's very important by applying biological resources, but also knowledge. So it's not only that we talk about plant biomass, but we would also be talking about um, biological principles, like for instance, uh, yeah, improving biorefinery processes or making use of bionics. You may know the lotus effect. Um, so transferring biological knowledge and biology, biologize, as we say, different industry sectors. Well, today, 16 years later in Germany, we are right now working on a monitor to uh, enable policymakers, but also industry to impact, uh, monitor the impact of the bioeconomy. So that's an interesting EU project, which is also now yeah, reaching grounds in Germany. Very interesting to see. And what does the future hold for us? So is the bioeconomy perhaps competing with other developments? Is it competing with the circular economy or with the overall sustainability development goals? And I would say obviously not because all these things are obviously intertwined. So there is a circular sustainable bioeconomy, which is a core instrument for the Green Deal, or especially also in the post-COVID area to make the EU and there are all the different countries and, and companies more sustainable and at the same time also more competitive. So that's the first of all, if you want to dig deeper, you may want to have at the uh, EU Commission's Knowledge, Cent Knowledge Center for the Bioeconomy, where you find a lot of documentation. And um, yeah, in my own definition, of course, every professor has its own definition or a visualization <laughs> of stuff. Um, what do we say? We, we, we call it uh, pretty much the biologize, biologization of the entire, perhaps not, industry. So by using biomass, here in the middle you see the biomass, and deploying biological know-how, we are enabling cascading usage of different materials to meet the SDGs. And here in Germany, we, um, there's a lot of public funding, I must say, which is a, a great situation for somebody like me who built a new chair group seven years ago. Um, and these funding schemes, they circle around um, different ideas in the Bioeconomic Science Center, where I'm uh, affiliated or a core group member of. So first of all, we look into how can we transform different raw materials uh, by different biorefineries into those different um, yeah, production or usage pathways. So looking at the very efficient production of biomass, then the second question would be, what can biorefineries do to convert biomass into the different areas? And then also, how can we use molecular knowledge and also uh, perhaps um, synthetic biology to really um, enter high value chemicals? 
because that's what you will see also later on today, I guess uh, the um, bioeconomy obviously needs to be competitive in order to reach those, as we call them, transformation pathways. So this is all the green actors, uh, uh, sectors here are newly emerging sectors. They are emerging between the old ones. And that's very interesting to study because in order for this to happen, you have to have different transformation pathways and different innovation types. What is very important too, is that the bioeconomy does not contradict with the circular economy, of course. The bioeconomy and the circular economy ideas are going obviously hand in hand. You may remember in the food, rather fuel discussion we had yeah, 10 years ago or even earlier, and that was actually a very bad one because in that uh, pers perspective of the bioeconomy, you would use food for uh, yeah, turning this into bioethanol, which is perhaps not the most sustainable idea and which creates then the conflict around the usage of plant biomass. So what is it, what we are after is exactly what also my co-speakers will, I guess, address is the cascading usage of biomass. So food first, that's also one very important principle of the EU Commission strategy on the bioeconomy. Then you derive perhaps ingredients out of the byproduct. And out of those ingredients, you still derive um, byproducts, which then perhaps are um, feedstocks for uh, further downstream bioplastics conversions. And then only at the very end, you would burn um, the residual to create energy out of biomass. So that's a very important, um, yeah, let's say, criterion of the bioeconomy to be sustainable. It needs to use um, raw materials in these cascading approaches. And of course, at every level, there's immense need for research, not only to produce biomass products more efficiently, but also to establish new usage and conversion options. So working on strains, working on bacteria, which allow for the uh, very efficient use and convergence of um, uh, plant uh, raw materials is key for the future. Yeah, and now it's becoming political. <laughs> if you look at the German uh, um, uh, site, the Bioökonomie Rat, uh, you see a very nice overview of all the different bioeconomy policies around the globe. And here you can see those in green, uh, in dark green, really do have a dedicated bioeconomy strategy. And it's very interesting. You can click on these uh, countries and then you see exactly how do these countries define the bioeconomy and what is their political framework in order to foster the bioeconomy. But still, even though this is existing, we don't see a huge take up. So there's perhaps a gap between um, what policymakers want and how the situation at the moment really looks like. So this is now uh, in, in school uh, in class. I would now ask, what is it, what do you think is the market share? Any best guess of bio-based plastics in Europe? Um, yeah, <laughs> let me solve uh, this little question. It's around six percent, and that's obviously not very much. And why is that? Imagine you are here. That this is a, a chemical plant together with some, um, yeah, oil uh, drilling. And what you can see here is, of course, a huge capital investment. So our industry right now is obviously past dependent. It's, it has invested a lot in the current fossil system. So therefore, this system systems change really needs to overcome a lot of different um, yeah, obstacles. And this is also what we work in in Western, yeah, in this uh, North Rhine-Westphalia area, the um, coal mining area. Um, where uh, different institutions join and seek to overcome the phasing out of coal mining and uh, yeah, fossil energy in Germany by uh, turning this area into a um, bioeconomy model region. So that's going to be also very interesting, perhaps, to, to look at in the future. This is a lot of governmental money is now being spent here to come up with a highly innovative um, approaches to foster the bioeconomy. Uh, Dr. Broering, I'm sorry, but the time is flying. So you have uh, four minutes left. For yeah. your presentation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.
thanks for reminding me, not getting too enthusiastic about this. So this transition I, I told you is needed, but how is that possible? It's possible by different innovations. And this is what I wanted to share with you initially also. We need to overcome the transition hurdles by being very smart. So you need to have, you need to combine not only new innovation in terms of substituting fossil fuels. So this would be innovation type one, where you do have an old function, but a new resource. Bulk chemicals such as ethanol uh, are a nice example here. I told you that this is perhaps problematic if it's using first generation biomass. And then the second type would be new biobased processes where you use biological um, uh, principles and you are replacing fossil uh, based um, ingredients by biological ones. So you're having um, biological processes. These would be the biorefineries, which we find uh, and which are emerging now also across Europe. Then you have um, new products where you have a, a biobased product, which is perhaps superior or has new functions. So that's the, the um, distinction from the substitu substitution here. And last but not least, if you remember the cascading flow, this requires new um, value chain connections and also new business models of established companies. Um, you need to be aware of your byproduct and you need to be aware of the uh, po potential commercial value it has, what you can do with it. You need, to, you need to form alliances with biotech partners to really use that. So this is what we then took as an example to, or as a study example, to understand what are the challenges for bioeconomy innovations. Mm -hmm. And this obviously is very difficult to read. Therefore, I well, that, this is what you find in the paper. So therefore, very briefly, this would be also the uh, last important message here from my side. If we really want to move the bioeconomy from mind to market, we need these substitutive products, ethanol as an example, they need to uh, be competitive in comparison with the fossil-based ones. And they need to be able to drop in into the existing value chains. You have seen the big um, cooperation and the big, you know, chemical plant I did show you. So this can't just be destructed. So you need to have bio-based pathways and also ingredients which are smoothly, um, yeah, playing their role in the existing system to gradually change, right? And then um, when it comes to the new value chains, the new processes we we just saw, you need new connections, and that's change of a business model which is not very easy. There's knowledge gaps companies don't know how to perform a, uh, let's say, biorefinery process if they are based in the food industry. That's completely not their business and not their knowledge area. Regulation is a problem. New products need to be accepted. And um, often there's also a long time span of development, high R&D costs, as we also know. And new behavior, yeah, that's very difficult because sometimes the willingness to change in a very efficient driven food industry, for instance, is not very easy to have. The logistics aren't there. And also the regulation for the different um, food wastes uh, are yet unclear. So missing industry standards are deterring investment from companies to really change their business models towards a more bio-based economy. Yeah, and with this, I think my time is over. That's right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's fine. Okay, These thank are... you, Professor Boring. Uh, I think the, the, the cascading approach is very important. It's, it's probably one of your, your most important slides here. It's, uh, if in my understanding, the bioeconomy is really a question of choice, how to make choices uh, between um, uh, different uses uh, for, for the same product. So how do I choose between food, feed, or cosmetics, or fuel? It's um, it's difficult to make choices, but, but then with the cascade, with the food first, and then feed, and then uh, the, the last choice would be energy uh, or, or burning what's left. I think it's it's uh, it's really interesting. You, the, the focus that you had also on partnerships, I think is important. And, uh, and I'm sure that um, Dr. Allais will, will also um, um, uh, 
uh, add to, to, to that because of the various partnerships that uh, he has in, in his own university. And, and uh, making the transition to uh, Florent Allais' presentation, uh, I think uh, that uh, you are going to present uh, one of the um, biorefineries ref that is in France that is uh, uh, sort of sh uh, showcase uh, biorefineries, that is the one of Pomac Bazancourt. Yeah. All right. The floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, next slide, please. All right, next slide also. Okay, thanks. So here you have an overview of the uh, what we call the Pomac de Bazonco biorefinery, which is located in France in the Grand Est region. Basically, it's a 15 minutes uh, from Reims, the, the city of Champagne which is well known in all around uh, the, the world. So in this site, basically, you can find different actors. The first one is the Crystal Union. This is a sugar beet refinery that produces sugar for food. Uh, on the left uh, hand side, you have the uh, ADM, which is a glucosary and starch plant. So from cereals and wheat, uh, that the, the, the produces gluten and glucose. Uh, on the same side, you can also find on the right inside the uh, Cristanol, which is a first generation distillery. So basically using uh, residues from the sugar beet plant and also wheat, they are able to produce bioethanol, but this is first generation. That means they are using food uh, resources. To, uh, to go further on the bioethanol strategy, you can find on the left, no, no, Back to the, the slide, please. Yeah, so on the left uh, bottom, you have the Futuro, which is a second generation bioethanol production site. So basically on this side, they are trying to use byproducts and non-food biomass to produce bioethanols. You, on the same site, you can also find Givoda Active Beauty, which is a, uh, a well-known company, uh, 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 an international company uh, dedicated to fragrances and uh, cosmetics. So here in this uh, biorefinery, they are focusing on uh, bio-based cosmetics, uh, such as uh, self-tanning, uh, hyaluronic acid, and that kind of products. And more recently, on the bottom left uh, side, on the uh, orange field, you can find the CBB that stands for European Center of Biotechnology and Bioeconomy. And this is where our bio team is located. So this is a public research center that is dedicated to the valorization of biomass. And on the next slide, I will show you how we can transform biomass into int interesting products. So as uh, Dr. Browring said, uh, we bioeconomy is all about transdisciplinarity. So this is also translate into my team where we can find three big uh, teams. So the first one is biotechnology team that is specialized in solid state fermentation, liquid state fermentation, as well as molecular biology. We also have a team dedicated to green chemistry and bio-based polymers and materials. And the third team is specializing in process engineering, mainly eco extraction. We also have a very well uh, established analytical chemistry platform that allow us to, very, uh, to, to check the uh, the, the, the components of the very complex mixture we are dealing with, but also the purity of the new product we are devising. And more recently, we, are, we have signed a, team, uh, an, um, a framework agreement with Abolis, which is a startup from Paris, which is specialized in synthetic biology. So through this, uh, this uh, partnership, we cover a lot of the uh, expertise needed to be able to transform biomass into value-added products. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see also that we have recently built into the in the team what we call business units. So basically we have <clears throat> identified four main markets, which are biomaterials and biopolymers, fine chemistry and specialty chemicals, cosmetics and crops else. So basically this is the markets we have uh, identified as promising for the bio-based economy. And these business unit in our team make the connection between what we do in the green chemistry, process engineering and biotechnology teams and the industrial partners we are working with. So the, the idea through these business units is to uh, foster and transfer innovation from the lab scale to the industrial scale. Next slide, please. 
So here on the left hand side of the, 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 the slide, you have some key, uh, key dates and our mission. So we have been created on, in October 2012, uh, 2012 sorry. Uh, our activity started on, in February 2013, so eight years ago, basically. And we uh, moved in the CBB, so the, the building I showed you, uh, back in April 2016. So basically our mission is, as I said in the introduction, is to identify and valorize agro-resources, biomass and byproducts through the combination of fundamental and applied research. So basically we want to foster innovation to boost local economy development. And how we are also a, T, a research team that belongs to AgroParisTech, we also have some teaching duties and we teach on our field of expertise that are chemistry, biotechnology and downstream processing. So here in this slide, you have basically what we aim uh, for. So we start from biomasses that are kind of very diverse. We have lignocellulosic biomass, oleaginous biomass, microalgae and vine, which are mo the, the most uh, locally uh, developed biomass. And through uh, fermentation, fractionation, we try to uh, fractionate this biomass into building blocks. And then starting from these building blocks, we develop and we optimize value chain that can transform these building blocks into the kind of product that you can find on the right hand side that can be antioxidants, polymers, biocontrols, surfactants, flavors, and so on. So there are a lot of different markets you can uh, address starting from biomass and uh, bio uh, economy approaches. Next slide, please. So here basically you have a very schematic uh, illustration of what we try to, to develop in the team. So basically we want to develop value chains that go from biomass on the left to the end product and finished product on the right, going through what we call building blocks. So building blocks to give you an idea, it's like the Lego, the, the, the Lego pieces you, you, you played with when you were a child. So basically from these building blocks, from the Lego bricks, we can basically build all kinds of products. And I'll give you some example later on. So the first step is to go from the biomass to the building blocks. We have two different approaches to do so. We can either directly extract the building blocks that are naturally present in the biomass. So it's just a simple extraction. And the other approach is that if these building blocks are not present in nature, we can synthesize them through either green chemistry or fermentation. And for the fermentation, this is where we have uh, a, a, a good advantage with working with abolis because they have a lot of expertise in synthetic biology. So basically synthetic biology is when you're able to uh, optimize micro microorganisms that can transform the biomass into the building blocks you're, you're, you're targeting. So this is a really interesting approach and this is a, a parallel approach to the direct extraction. Once you have the building block, then you can apply green chemistry principle and or biotechnology, and then you can access the final products you, you, you want to access. And to, to be able to devise and address this value chain, you need a lot of expertise in downstream process to separate, purify, and integrate the different steps of the process. And once again, we need analytical chemistry expertise to, to check on the purity and the efficiency of the process. On the next slide, I'll show you some examples. So the first one is an example of what we have been exploring for eight years now in the team. So basically we start from local biomass. The, the, these are local biomass. The first one is a rapeseed and the other is a mustard. So we have a lot of rapeseed and mustard fields uh, in the region. So we have basically started with this kind of biomass. We have done some enzymatic hydrolysis and extraction to extract Synapic acid, this is a molecule in the middle of the, the slide, which this is a building blocks. And from these building blocks, we have devised a lot of different approaches using green chemistry and biocatalysis. And we've been able to devise a lot of products such as antioxidant and anti-UV molecules for cosmetics. We have also been able to develop uh, uh, bisphenol A substitutes. So bisphenol A is a toxic molecule, which is uh, petrobase. And we've been able through synapic acid and thus from biomass such as rapeseed and mustard, we've been able to propose alternatives that have the same properties, but without the toxicity. So there is a good advantage of doing so. We have also uh, been able to uh, synthesize new biopolymers with very interesting properties. 
and also cosmetic ingredients such as um, antimicrobials and preservat preservatives. On the next slide, this is another kind of project we've been working on in, in the team. So this is part of the, what we call the Alpo Interact project. So as you can imagine, it involves teams from Belgium, uh, from France, and also from uh, Switzerland, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. So basically, this is a project dedicated to microalgae valorization. So the first step is the extraction to extract the three main components of the microalgae, which are the secondary metabolites, the lipid and the carbohydrates. And then once these three components have been separated, we can transfer them separately into the products I shown you can see on the, the, the right hand side, antioxidants and anti-UV cosmetics, which are different from the, 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 the previous slide, biopolymers, and also uh, we can also make some plasticizers. Plasticizers is a type of molecule we use to turn the plastic into flexible materials. So once again, from a different biomass, so last slide that was mustard and rapeseed, and here this is microalgae. So depending on the biomass you're, play, you're playing with, you can extract different kinds of molecules and thus uh, expand the, 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 the scope in terms of markets and application. On the next slide, this is another project we have been working on uh, recently. So this time we aimed at valorizing buds, barks, and branches from orchards and vines. So the first stage will be the extraction of secondary metabolites, the building blocks, the legal bricks. Once we have extracted the building blocks, we can use the waste pr to produce biogas as Dr. Browing showed you uh, a few minutes ago. So the first step of the cascade will be to extract the high value added compound, in this case, the secondary metabolites, and the rest will be uh, methanized to produce biogas. From the metabolites, we've been able to uh, access, once again, uh, cosmetic ingredients, antioxidants, anti-UV molecules, but also green solvents for the industry as well as green chemicals. So once again, from different biomass byproducts, we can access a lot of a wide, wide range of products and markets. Finally, the last, last slide. It's a, a very interesting project. And here in this case, we wanted to valorize the sawdust from the paper industry. So this project started in 2013 when we met with Circa, which is a startup from Australia. And in 2013, they had devised a flash pyrolysis process that transformed sawdust into levoglucosinone. It's a barbaric name, but it's a very interesting molecule. Once again, it's a building block. It's a Lego brick. And from this building block, we have devised two main uh, valorizations. The first one is the transformation of levoglucosinone into what we call HBO in short, which is another building block. And from this HBO, we have uh, patented a lot of different application. We've made some flavoring agent for the food industry. We've uh, devised drugs such as antivirus molecules. We have also been able to produce surfactants for the surfactant industry, and also some pheromones for biocontrol and uh, crop health. And the other application is the one we call green solvent sirene. It's a very interesting solvent, which is green. And we have devised a biotechnological process to transform levoglucosinone into the sirene product. So you can see that starting from sawdust, which is a very uh, uh, available biomass and very cheap, you can access a lot of different molecules that can have a very good value. For instance, the HBO, you can sell it for 240 euro per gram. And so does, to give you an example, cost between 50 and 100 euro a ton. So you can see the value you can theoretically expect from this kind of approach. And finally, the last slide, it's a very interesting uh, uh, project. So as I told you previously, we have been able to synthesize sarin, the green solvent from using a biotechnological process. And recently with our colleague from Circa and with a partner partnership with Merck the, the, from Germany, we have obtained a very huge grant from the Europe. It's a BBI H2020 flagship grant called Resolute. And basically through this project, the idea is to scale up the project, the, the, the process. We have validated at the bench scale in this kind of reactor to the industrial scale on the right-hand side 
to go to the industrialization of this green solvent. So we can th that perfectly illustrate that starting from a very fundamental project, if all the lights are green, you can basically go from the bench scale to the industrial scales, scale and commercialize your products. And I hope that through this uh, different example, I've uh, convinced you that there is a lot of advantages in using biomass and byproducts to develop green molecules, green solvent energy to, uh, to, 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 to as good alternatives to fossil-based uh, chemistry and uh, technology. So thanks. Thank you very much, Florent. That, that was um, a wonderful illustration of, uh, of the scene uh, that, uh, that set uh, Dr. Brory in the, in, in the beginning. It, and I understand uh, doing the, the bio or engaging in, in to the bioeconomy is like uh, uh, playing with the Lego bricks. So it, mm -hmm. it looks like the, um, the possibilities are, are uh, endless. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's it's uh, it seems really promising. Um, I, I also noted the that you insisted on the local economy or the global um, possibilities or dimensions of the of the bio economy. Mm -hmm. um, locally speaking, your your lab is located in the Grand, Grand Est uh, region in, in France that is really at the crossroads of agriculture, industry, and research. And it's it's it really makes sense that. Uh, the bioeconomy is emerging uh, in mm -hmm. many different uh, projects here, but also you mentioned the uh, the, the global territory of the bioeconomy and and uh, with with Jenny K now we're going to have a an, a, another a, a very great example of um, uh, uh, the bioeconomy with a global perspective, uh, international trade, and also um, uh, adding value to waste that is not waste anymore, but becomes byproducts uh, that can be actually uh, upgraded to high value, high value products. And and your example is uh, is the the, the 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 byproducts of the cocoa industry that can. <clears throat> become uh, actually through the the, um, the the process that you have put together in, in circular carbon uh, that it, that can be uh, processed into biochar that is a high value product uh, especially uh, in in terms of input in in agriculture uh, a sort of a high value um, fertilizer if I understand well yeah. So Jenny, please please uh, tell us a little more about about uh, the the technology of uh, circular carbon and and uh, and all this uh, value adding that that you do. Thank you very much, Marie Cecile. Um, yeah, hello everybody. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about our company, Circular Carbon. Um, I think we provide a nice example of how biomass. Um, can be um, as a renewable resource uh, can be given value in a sustainable way. And uh, the story starts um, really by showing some of the challenges uh, our planet faces today, uh, which are not new. But this slide shows uh, the increase in deforestation in Ivory Coast uh, over the years. Uh, Ivory Coast being the largest cocoa grower um, in the world and uh, deforestation contributes to climate change uh, by removing the uh, carbon dioxide uh, fixating trees. Um, uh, by uh, reducing the rainforest, we uh, decrease biodiversity and the extensive uh, monocultures of co cocoa plantations also contribute to uh, reducing the soil fertility, which is on, in the long term um, not very constructive. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the chocolate industry um, has a problem and they're trying to address it. And so uh, we started working since 2017 uh, with the largest chocolate manufacturer in the world called Barry Calibo. And um, they have pledged to become carbon neutral by 2025. Um, uh, and um, also to improve uh, the soil fertility um, uh, so that they can have a sustainable growth of uh, uh, cocoa um, trees. 
So um, yes, how are we do, how are we doing this? So um, the production of um, chocolate products uh, go through the production of cocoa liquor, cocoa butter, and cocoa powder. And uh, one of the waste products is the shell which surrounds the the, beet, the cocoa bean, and it's a waste product. Uh, today, it gets sold to another company which burns it, uh, releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so uh, we are building a production facility uh, next to a Barry Curlibo factory in Hamburg, Germany, uh, where the cocoa um, uh, bean shells uh, will be paralyzed, which means they'll be heated to high temperature with uh, limited uh, or no oxygen to produce a product called biochar. And this pyrolysis process generates energy. Um, and so in the, in the shape of steam, uh, the steam will be uh, then transferred back to the chocolate production. Um, so in that way, um, they will be saving on the use of, of natural gas in their process. Um, and also um, generating biochar, which um, is a high uh, carbon uh, material, um, uh, which has carbon in a stable form and um, is a, a carbon dioxide um, sequestration uh, uh, tool. Uh, so Barry Calibro is able to reduce their carbon emissions by saving some transport costs on the shells, um, saving energy uh, by using the steam which is generated by the, the pyrolysis uh, and uh, fixing um, the, the carbon um, in the biochar. And um, sorry, yeah, <laughs> maybe you can go back. I haven't quite finished. Um, and also we are doing trials with Barry Calibo to use uh, the cocoa uh, bean shell uh, biochar in the growing regions. Um, in the cocoa plantation to increase their yields, uh, improve the fertility, uh, reduce potentially uh, fertilizer. So um, uh, yeah, that's also something that's uh, I think uh, a nice story. Um, we also want to uh, start with new projects uh, more locally in the growing region so that the cocoa shells um, stay in, uh, in North Africa and can be used then um, in the plantations. Um, in the, in the shape of uh, biochar. Yeah, next please. So what is our business, business model? Um, so uh, yes, we do project development. Uh, we design and implement projects uh, for the biochar industry. Um, we have received uh, funding from uh, Econex Group, which is an investment company that invests in startups which have environmental and social responsibility. So we've received funding from them. Um, and we've also um, received loans from uh, banks uh, and also some, um, we apply also for, for grants. Um, and that's enabled us to have a zero capex service model, uh, which is unique to industry. So the players are quite happy uh, not to have to buy the manufacturing line and um, put money up front. Um, and then we have a team of experienced uh, engineers uh, who have experience in, in pyrolysis technologies uh, over 10 years. And so, um, yeah, we build the, the line and, and we operate it. And we also have a team uh, of salespeople who will be, um, who are um, selling, um, negotiating with uh, other businesses to um, uh, buy our biochar. Next, please. <laughs> Um, so we um, want to remain very flexible in the use of the biomass um, and, the, and, and also work with uh, potential other partners. Uh, and so we take responsibility for a wide range of activities. So starting with a feasibility study, um, what technology can be used, um, uh, doing calculations on, on energy um, emissions and savings, understanding the regular regulatory environment, installing the line, uh, understanding the product characteristics. So a uh, very wide way, range of activities. Next, please. Um, so the company was founded by uh, a CEO, CEO Felix and um, CEO Peck. Uh, they have uh, worked in the pyrolysis and pyrolysis projects in North Africa uh, in the UK, so they have uh, experience in um, uh, 
um, Paris's technology and setting up companies. Uh, and then uh, in under finance and biochar sales on the right, we have uh, Julian and, and Lasse, uh, who are also co-founders and have worked in a number of um, setting up companies in renewable energy, so they also have experience. On the right hand side, you can see we have uh, the Hamburg operation team. So we have um, um, engineers to um, install the Pyrosis equipment, but also running. So this is a team which is uh, developing today as we take new people on. Um, and we also have uh, people who help with the project management and project development. Next, please. So um, a little bit about, uh, about biochar. So um, biochar is a cold like material and it's produced, it can be produced from different feedstocks. Typically, historically, it's been made from wood, but it can also uh, be, uh, be made from uh, different food wastes in, in, and, um, and manure. For example, in China, they use a lot of rice husks because they have a lot of rice husks to mix uh, biochar. Um, the biomass is heated to temperatures between 300 and 1000 degrees C, as I mentioned, in an oxygen limited environment. And so based on the feedstock and the pyrolysis time temperature and the technology used, it can have different pro uh, properties. Uh, typically, it's a very porous material, so it acts like a sponge and takes up water uh, and can other bind, bind all sorts of uh, chemicals based on its porosity, its surface area, and um, also some of the functional groups which are on the surface of the, the biochar. Um, yeah, depending on the, the biomass bio used, it can also have uh, nutrients, which is very useful for the soil. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it's quite a wide range of different um, uh, properties. Um, biochar is typically not used to burn, so it's um, not meant to be burnt to, otherwise you'd release um, carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And the feedstock has to be sustainable, so it's, it's not about um, it, um, growing biomass for producing biochar, but, but using like waste material. Uh, next, please. So um, there are lots of applications um, for biochar. Um, the Itaka Institute, which is uh, an institute based in Switzerland, specialized in biochar, released a paper with 52 different applications. Um, to give you some examples, so uh, it has been used traditionally in Germany, Switzerland, Austria by farmers uh, and fed to animals um, to reduce animal sickness, improve the food intake, uh, they get less diarrhea, less uh, vet bills, and general uh, well-being. Um, you talked about cascade use. I think biochar is, is a nice example of how it can be used in, in, in cascade use. So it can be added to, to the silage first to um, reduce um, the, the moisture uptake, uh, bind uh, mycotoxins or prevent mycotoxin development. Then the silage could be uh, fed to the cows, which then improves their health. Um, Studies have also shown that um, it can reduce met methane emissions from cows, which is um, also nice. Uh, then it gets combined with the manure, um, which is also good for the manure storage to reduce um, uh, greenhouse gases emission during storage. But then the biochar gets charged up with nice nutrients through the man manure, uh, and then it can be used in the fields uh, to improve uh, plant yield and um, increase organic matter. So I think that's a nice example. Um, yeah, it has been used in biogas plants to increase the energy yield and, and reduce some inhibitors. Uh, it can actually be activated by further chemical and physical treatment to increase the porosity and uh, increase the surface area and use, for example, in the water treatment plants um, to buy organic chemicals. Um, it has a low thermal conductivity and can, um, and through its uptake of water can be used in construction industry for insulation and in cement or asphalt um, in beauty products. So there's, there's a wide range of, of uh, different uh, uses. Next, please. 
Um, so more specifically for, for its use in, in soil. So it has a it can have a number of agricultural benefits so through its water holding capacity. Um, in the cases of, of, of drought or, or water um, shortages um, or for water uh, saving um, through its uptake of water. Um, it can have a limin effect, increasing the pH of soil um, it, and um, that helps retain nutrients. It can improve the cation exchange capacity, uh, help build organic carbon and, and humus. Um, so um, there has been interesting meta-analysis study uh, showing an increase in crop yield, um, an average of 25%, and in tree growth uh, in tropical soils by 38% um, in, in, in tropical climates. Um, so it seems to be very affected in those soils, um, increasing the pH and helping uh, retain nutrients in depleted soils where they can have events of uh, high rain, which can um, run off a lot of the, the nutrients. Um, in climate, in, in temperate climates, um, it works better in combination with compost or other fertilizers, uh, also showing some good results. Um, so that's the agricultural benefits. Oops, sorry, back. Do I still have a bit of time? Uh, one minute. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, and then we have um, the climate mitigation. Um, so it's a biochar sequestrous carbon. It's uh, recognised as uh, by the inter intergovernmental panel of climate change as a negative uh, emission technology. So it can store um, carbon for thousands of years. There's also been studies showing that it can, um, in soils, reduce uh, quite significantly the um, uh, the nitrous oxide emissions and um, also reduce uh, nit nitrate leaching. And then finally, it can also be used um, to remediate, um, um, in remediation, uh, binding inorganic and organic toxins, um, sorry, um, chemicals in, in soils. Um, so yes, it has a wide range of um, applications in soils. Thank you, Jenny. It, it's, uh, it's amazing to see all these uh, potential um, uses of, of biochar. And maybe you wanted to comment on this, uh, on this sentence here on, on your last slide. <laughs> yeah, just to finish off um, by this sentence. So put in biochar and soil could over time reverse the history of the last 200 years. So it's uh, really quite a good potential in terms of um, uh, negative emission technology. Um, mm -mm. Wonderful. It, it really sounds like a Swiss, Swiss army knife. It, it can do everything. It's, uh, I'm, I'm thinking especially of the uh, carbon sequestration. That, uh, that sounds uh, really interesting. Um, okay, sorry, my phone was ringing. <laughs> so um, um, I, I have a few questions for, for the three of you. Uh, I, I'd like to give the opportunity to uh, Stephanie and Florent to react to, uh, to Jenny's presentation. And I also have a, a few questions from the audience. Um, what, in, in your point of view, what uh, would be the main obstacles to the uh, unfolding of the, of the bioeconomy? You, you presented it. it, it sounds wonderful, wonderful possibilities, but isn't it the main obstacles, uh, on the main obstacles, um, regulation and uh, the competitivity of, of uh, uh, bio-based products compared with uh, oil-based products from the petrol-based e economy uh, and, and and also this scaling up that is really the focus on, of this um, uh, webinar today, uh, isn't it very challenging because finding um, uh, uh, sources of, of, uh, of funding from public uh, or private uh, partners, isn't it challenging in, in, this, uh, in, the, in today's context? Um, so that would be the, the first set of questions. Uh, the second one would be, um, how can consumers be informed of the fact that uh, a product, uh, I mean, uh, I'm thinking cosmetics or in food or in bioplastics, is it easy to, to inform consumers of, of the fact that it's a bio-based product? Uh, or would it be a way to, um, to add value to, um, to, to the product? Would be uh, uh, 
sort of traceability uh, system from from the production to the uh, to the consumer end. Um, and uh, and then there's um, a few questions for um, for for Jenny, um, specifically for, for for Jenny from the audience. Um, so. Uh, the, the first one was um, when you mentioned uh, we are actually looking at um, uh, sending back biochar to Ivory Coast. Uh, is it already done? Uh, can farmers in Ivory Coast already use bio the biochar you produce? Um, <clears throat> and uh, another question to you specifically is, would it be possible to develop biochars from local crops uh, in, in Europe and, and uh, add value to European byproducts? Shall I answer the first question? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, we're doing trials at the moment um, uh, to see how it works. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be working uh, to develop um, new factories in the location may, using the cocoa uh, pod, um, which is also a biomass, which um, uh, is um, readily available there. So that's to answer uh, the first question. Uh, the second question, sorry, remind me. <laughs> How to process uh, biochar from uh, European-based crops? Yeah, we're also it's investigating, so the use of, um, uh, in, in the municipalities, um, the, the, the hedges and the trees, uh, tree cuttings that they used, for example, and we've had some discussions also locally um, in uh, Franken, which is uh, part of Germany, where they also uh, have um, grapes for wine um, vineyards. So, um, so we're, we're in discussion to have uh, with uh, different partners to, to use different bio biomass uh, locally. Okay, uh, Dr. Brorin. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, should I uh, respond to the first one, the challenges you said? You mentioned yes. already two. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think you mentioned, if I um, remember correctly, there's two major challenges, the competitiveness, and secondly, um, regulation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it, as always, depends on what we're talking about. If we are talking about pure substitution, if you remember my <laughs> um, attempt to structurize all the innovations in four different angles, four different types. So if it's a, a pure substitution of a fossil yeah, ingredient or energy or whatever you have by a, a bio-based one, then obviously it needs to be competitive. And then that's, that's the major um, problem if that's not in place, that competitiveness. So what needs to be there is obviously a value added, and that obviously needs to be um, perceived as an advantage by the end consumer to increase the overall value generation across the entire value chain. So therefore, I think your question is strongly connected with the one of how do we communicate this across to the end market. Mm -hmm. And there you see, uh, you see a rise in different programs and different quality programs, um, different um, labeling, and also the EU um, uh, Green Deal um, comes along with more, a, a bigger shift towards more sustainable production. So I am quite optimistic that this, some time, at, 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 at some point also will lead to a more competitive situation. Why? Because the, the more sustainable alternative is superior in terms of functionality, perhaps. So it's not the same. And um, it's um, yeah, bio-based nature is appreciated more throughout the supply chain. But that pretty much obviously depends on the product class. So if you would be talking about a, yeah, low a commodity product it's, it doesn't really it's very difficult but if you the more you you you, you are entering into um yeah specialties chemicals specialty chemicals as the pr presentation also by florent has very nicely demonstrated the more likely you will be to to enter into a competitive zone the last uh, point uh, regulation yes of course there needs to be standards and these standards 
sometimes need to be defined in a new way for bio-based products. So only as soon as there is an industry standard, you have more investment and more planning security of the public sector to, as a private sector, to invest into it. So that's obviously also um, a condition which needs to put in place. Yeah, that's my answers to your question. Thank you very much. Florent? Well, uh, Dr. Boring already answered the question about the regulations and the uh, competitiveness. And I totally agree with her that this is huge obstacles right now. And if we want to, to be able to overcome these obstacles, we need to, as she said, focus on niche technology, niche products, niche markets. Because if we want to replace substitute commodities, uh, commodity products, it will be quite difficult in terms of economical aspects. Uh, another uh, issue we have to deal with is the availability of the biomass. Mm. So we have to make sure that the biomass we are using will be available in a quantity large enough to be processed. Uh, so this is one, one obstacle. We also need to check that the price of the biomass won't fluctuate too much because the more uses you're going to develop, the more expensive the biomass is going to get. So this is another issue to, to take into account very early in the process. And the third uh, aspect will be the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, potential destabilization of the current uses and markets. For instance, we are talking about byproducts or residues, and we think that they have no usage, but they do. For instance, wheat, wheat bran is used for feed application for cattle, for instance. So if you wanna use this biomass for other application, we have to make sure that we want to stabilize the market and want to use all of the available wheat bran, or otherwise we will, won't be able to feed the cattle any longer. So there are many different aspects to take into account when we devise new application for a specific biomass. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you very much. Um, maybe one last question to, to all of you. What would be the, what are the, the most promising markets uh, for bio-based products? Um, uh, you mentioned cosmetics, uh, uh, bioplastics, uh, the food industry with additives. Yeah. Uh, w what would be the, uh, the others? There is a huge demand on bio-based solution for crop health, biocontrol. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea is to replace insecticides, herbicides by more sustainable bio-based non-toxic solutions and bioeconomy could be an answer. Uh, yeah, that, that, that would be a market to, 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 to focus on. And uh, yeah, cosmetics, uh, also pharmaceuticals. I think there are the huge uh, opportunities in the pharmaceutical industry to substitute current uh, petrol-based fine chemicals by bio-based ones. So this is also a market we are investigating in our group right now. Okay. Stephanie, did you want to add something to the um, promising uh, sectors? I guess what we need to be in mind is that it's, um, you know, if, if you look at the so-called mega trends, what is it? We have um, the convergence of different technologies, but also end markets. So if, if you answer this question in the very technical means, I would say that the whole area of what can be done with synthetic biology um, is super interesting. And there obviously this will be the more value added, the more expensive if you want applications and not the pure um, substitution of energy and so on. Mm -hmm. And to, to add to that, if you take then digitalization and all those different uh, yeah, opportunities technology brings, I could see even more different application fields uh, starting with the you know, high level medical, pharmaceutical applications, but we are also working uh, in Bonn together with bio biotechnologists on um, the, uh, the, um, um, the opportunity to switch different circuits by um, biological means, so so-called bio switches, which are then part of um, mechanical engineering. So a completely new application field, um, which I find super fascinating. So there's a lot 
what, what one can do. But readiness levels and time to market and uh, competitiveness or um, their yeah, sales in some of these examples I just mentioned are, I would say, 10 years down the road. <laughs> yes. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Jenny, do you, you have the last word. Um, the, the, we saw all the, all the promising markets for biochar. So which ones will, would be the most uh, uh, promising among all, all of, the, of, of those that you, uh, you just indicated? Um, we're focusing on um, soil amendment. Um, mm -hmm. Our um, biochar is um, quite interesting, has nutrients in, and um, uh, we think that's a, a promising area, uh, reducing the uh, amount of um, uh, chemical fertilizers, for example. And that's one area. And um, animal feed as well um, is also one which is uh, very interesting. And uh, biogas um, yield improvement is also quite a promising uh, one. Uh, but there, there, there are many, many. <laughs> and um, it, it's uh, quite complex and technical. Um, lots of fields to, to, to discover. So Thank you very much. Well, thank you to, uh, to the three of you. It's been a great conversation, a, a lot of information, uh, extremely informative. And it was uh, the, the, the last um, conference for this in vivo quest tour for this year. Thank you very much uh, for, um, to, to all of you actually for, for being part, part of it. Um, it will be available uh, on replay. Um, probably tomorrow, uh, as it's always the case for these uh, conferences. Um, and uh, actually, the, the, the next step is the closing ceremony of uh, In Vivo Quest, and it will take place on uh, April the 22nd. So I, I hope to, uh, to see you then. Bye-bye, and thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.